Hi and welcome to another interview for Lab Down Under. This week I'm going to be speaking with Professor Matthew Phillips of the Queensland University of Technology. I talked to Professor Phillips about the different types of gene sequencing and his latest research on basically looked at uh, how we test the genes for extinct mammals, in particular some megafauna. So we know of mammals like the saber-toothed cat and there are other really cool creatures such as the uh, club-tailed glyptodont which is basically like a massive armadillo with a big club for a tail. And uh, Professor Phillips basically talked about the two different uh, methods for testing the genes, the DNA that we get out of specimens of these animals, mitochondrial uh, gene sequencing and nuclear gene sequencing. And his research specifically focused on mitochondrial gene sequencing and how that basically helps us put these different animals, these different extinct specimens that we find in the bigger evolutionary family tree. And um, it was all very, very interesting, and I learned a lot, and I hope you will too. So let's get on to the interview. I hope you enjoy it. Well, first off, yeah, so thanks for sitting down, <laughs> taking the yeah, time not to talk to me on the lab down under, under as well. Um, spotted your, um, your research paper, and it was interesting. So I wanted to talk about it, but I think before we do get into the actual study itself, um, it might be good to go over the two different types of uh, genetic sequencing that you mention in yeah. the paper. We call micro mi uh, mitochondrial and uh, nucleic or nuclear those terms, right? Nuclear, yes, <laughs> gene sequencing. Yeah. So the sequencing themselves is actually relatively similar in this mm -hmm. particular case. Um, I guess the difference is that they they come from different genomes. So the nuclear genome is that great big genome of ours that's in the nucleus of our cells. Mm -hmm. It includes about three billion, or in humans at least, about three billion base pairs of, of DNA. Uh, the mitochondria DNA is much smaller and it's a little circular genome inside an organelle called a mitochondrion. And it's only about 17,000 bits of DNA. So much, much smaller. Um, Okay. But sequenced in much the same way. And so do they, uh, because our genes dictate, you know, our physical properties and that, so do, do they both uh, affect, uh, affect our cells, affect our bodies in the same kind of way, these two yes, obviously the, bits of know, DNA? The nuclear DNA being much bigger and in mm -hmm. our chromosomes is, is obviously massively important and contributes most of our genetic information. Mm -hmm. um, the mitochondrial DNA is, it's kind of a, well, the mitochondria itself is a little organelle that was an endosymbiote. It was brought into cells um, probably over a billion years ago, and, and we've maintained these. So plants have them, animals have them, lots of little protists have them. Mm -hmm. um, and they're like the energy powerhouses of our cells, mm -hmm. these little mitochondria. And they've got their own little bit of remnant DNA left over, which was once upon a time more, and quite a bit of what they had of their DNA has now been shuffled off into the nuclear genomes, but there's a bit left over. And, and that's involved in some of the key proteins um, in our energy cycles. And also for making, and also for um, bits of DNA that code for RNA that helps make their own RNAs and helps make, um, some little parts for the mitochondrial, uh, the mitochondria themselves. Okay. So they're uh, like an evolutionary remnant. All right. So your paper looked at um, extinct megafauna and the different DNA sequencing options. And as you said, we said that there are two two options now: the mitochondrial and the nuclear sequencing. Yeah. So why has nuclear sequencing kind of been preferred? when looking at these older, more extinct mammals? Yeah, so not necessarily with extinct mammals, but in general, if you're looking at uh, deeper divergences in evolution, for example, uh, between different families or between different orders, um, say, for example, cats versus dogs, or if you went a bit deeper to, for example, um, parrots against perching birds, 
Mm -hmm. um, people would tend to prefer using the nuclear DNA because it's um, it maintains its signal better. So the mitochondria, it, it evolves a lot slower, whereas the mitochondrial DNA evolves really fast. Mm -hmm. And as because it evolves really fast, um, different changes kind of overtop each other. And so it loses its signal over time. OK, so that basically means that you can um, for the nuclear DNA, you can basically see where it's come from a lot clearer so, than for the mitochondrial DNA. Yeah, it has fewer superimposed changes or what people call less saturation. Mm -hmm. and so it tends to provide a clearer signal for relationships and for dating the, the timing of divergences uh, deeper into the past. Ah, oh, OK. So that's okay. why people have tended to prefer it. Yeah, so the history, the, yeah, the history of the evolution of that particular creature is kind of mapped more clearly. Yeah, it, it, it can provide a bit more clarity. A bit more, more, okay, a bit more clarity. So in that case, why did you decide to look at the um, mitochondrial DNA sequencing in your research then? So mitochondria have a few other really useful properties. And um, one of them is that, that the DNA itself is is packaged up in such a way that it's the order of genes is really clear. Um, also, people can use it for understanding what's going on at, within populations, right through to between different um, phyla of, of animals. So it's got a really wide potential for use. Uh, but one particular thing about this paper and that others have noted is that mitochondrial DNA tends to preserve better. Mm -hmm. You're more likely to get mitochondrial DNA from ancient specimens, specimens that are thousands of years old. Okay. So yeah. Um, and, and that's largely down to the fact that mitochondrial DNA is there in much greater copy numbers. And so if there's a lot more of it, mm -hmm. obviously ancient DNA tends to get degraded. Yeah. But if there's a lot more copies of, of mitochondrial DNA, then you've got a better chance of sequencing that. Okay, okay, I understand. So even though um, the mitochondrial DNA might have more superimpositions over time in modern day mammals, it still lasts for longer, I guess, in the in the extinct mammals, and so well, lasts for longer than the nuclear. The, the capacity to, to find it or to actually make use of it yes. uh, tends to be better. Yeah. Point of the paper was that you made some improvements, I guess, to the mitochondrial DNA sequencing. So, can you explain what they were, what those were, and how they basically, yeah made the process better, made the gene sequencing process better? Yeah, so I guess the sequencing itself was much the same. In fact, that in these cases had been done by other people. Mm -hmm. um, and so we just used those gene sequences. Um, so normally, um, as I said, that mitochondrial DNA tends to erode its signal fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and DNA comes in four bases, A, C, G, T. Mm -hmm. Um, and a lot of that variation, that signal happens at, at what's known as transitions. So T's and C's tend to swap a lot and A's and G's tend to swap a lot. So if what you what we did was just lump the A's and G's together, call them R, lump the C's and T's together, call them Y, and then just simply by doing that, we're removing a, a lot of that um, erratic aspect of the DNA. Hmm. Um, so when you have it just coded as R and Y, then evolving from one of those to the other is a much slower process, and so you're retaining a lot of that signal. Ah, oh, okay. So you effectively removed the a lot of the noise. Yeah. In so that signal, but in, yeah. in a sense, it's a kind. Of, it is a kind of a noise reduction process. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So I'm going to jump straight to the last question then, which is about why this is kind. Why this thing why these advancements are important. Um, yeah, why is it important to get these this higher accuracy, these advancements in gene sequencing? So in this particular case, some of those extinct species that we had included in the study had only ever previously been um, sequenced for mitochondrial DNA. Mm -hmm. And so if people are uncertain about whether mitochondrial DNA is able to give um, a clear picture or, or an accurate set of relationships, then we thought, well, if we can, if we can benchmark our new analyses against bits of phylogeny that people agree on, mm -hmm. transfer that to the 
the parts that are only known for mitochondrial DNA, then we can we can say yes, yeah, some of these ancient relationships or ancient DNA species, um, we can just be a bit more confident about them. Mm -hmm. So in the past, we might have got DNA, mitochondrial DNA from some of these, had a go at getting relationships for it or understanding where it sits in the in the tree of life, mm -hmm. and being a bit confident. Whereas I think now we can be a bit more confident. Yeah, and, and in, in each case, we we got the result that we pretty much expected, but with a little bit better confidence. Okay, okay. So where did you end up? So you didn't end up having to kind of rejig the tree of life, as you no. call it, moving this this animal to this spot instead. Um, but you're kind of more confident that where it sat, yeah, yeah, was the correct spot. I think it also provides a little bit of more hope for for additional ancient DNA or ancient mitochondrial DNA studies that will be coming online. Mm -hmm. So as people get more of these more of these um, bits of DNA, they'll be able to use them. And if they use these methods that do things such as RY coding, then hopefully they'll be able to have a bit more confidence in in what they're doing with their family trees with these. So is there anything else now that um kind of needs to be done to build on these findings and kind of further improve the accuracy? Um, no, there, I'm, I'm sure there will be things that, that can be done. There's mm -hmm. always improvements that can be made to the to the modeling. I think we're at a point now where we're, we're doing pretty well. And mm -hmm. so I think I'm quite happy with the way that we can analyze the data. So now I'm just really keen for some, some more fascinating bits of DNA to come along. So for example, here in Australia, we've got some really weird creatures that went extinct roughly in about the time that people arrived or a little after things like marsupial lions and no one knows really exactly where these things fit among among marsupials for example so we'd love to get a bit of ancient mitochondrial dna from these now and be able to, to show where they fit in and better understand the evolution of marsupials and the same could be said for lots of other groups across the world all right well thanks very much matt for this yeah thank you nice no to meet problem. you exactly this too. yeah so have a good day, man. Okay. Bye. Bye. Well, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you would like to learn more about Professor Phillips' research, I'm going to be putting a link to the lab down on the blog below, as well as some links to Professor Phillips' uh, own websites where you can find out more information. If you want to support Lab Down Under, you can leave a like, subscribe to my YouTube channel, um, put a comment below if you want. And there are also many, many other ways you can support the blog, including Patreon, which I will link to below if you want to give some money to, to help support the blog. And of course, you can always subscribe to the email newsletter that I have sent out on the blog itself. So until next time, keep on being curious and peace out. Bye.